Buy your sled 66111 Skills for the rest of your life Bootstraps and probability It's the bread and butter, baby, what's your jam? Greetings, Bio 6611. In this lecture, we're going to further examine categorical data and tests of association with a rapid fire review of various tests we can use to evaluate two by two and related tables to compare two different categorical variables. We'll first introduce and talk about the chi-squared test before discussing some tests for small sample sizes that occur when the chi-squared test is not appropriate. We'll then wrap up with a discussion of McNamara's test for paired samples of data. So let's start with the chi-squared test. Now first let's touch base on our last lecture, where we had effect measures for 2x2 two two tables such as the risk difference, the relative risk or risk ratio, and the odds ratio. And we saw each one of those had a respective associated confidence interval, and there's different methods for obtaining it. We provided some formulas in the last lecture, but we can note that different software may have different ways of approaching the formulas or different approximations. Because of this, it is just important to keep in mind, the second paragraph here, that the confidence interval for an effect measure can sometimes be at odds with the corresponding p-value we may get for that test statistic. This particularly happens when the results are what we would call marginally significant or really close to the boundary we're trying to evaluate at, such as an alpha of 0.05 and p being near 0.05. Now, this is partially a result of the mismatch between the different ways we may calculate a confidence interval, but then may not carry through to how we calculate the p-value for the test statistic. Regardless of those assumptions, though, in the study design we use, we can always look at a test of the hypothesis of no association between an exposure and a disease using one and the same test statistic for all of the study designs. We're going to continue working with the 2x2 two two table to test our associations. Just to review what we saw previously, this is looking at a test between some, let's say, exposure and an outcome like a disease. Our null hypothesis that we want to test in this case is that there is no association between the exposure of interest and the disease outcome. This can be directly related to our definition as well that we talked about previously for two independent events in terms of their probability. In other words, if we say exposure is E and disease is D, the probability of E and D occurring, they're independent if and only if the probability of E times the probability of D is equal to that joint probability of E and D. Based on our study, we can then set up a 2x2 two two table with these exposure and disease outcomes and measures to summarize the results. For the case of a chi-squared test, we're going to introduce this right now in terms of the observed counts per cell. So we see O11 is the first cell in the first row in the first column and it's the observed count. Likewise, we can define that for each combination of exposure and disease, and like before, we also have the rows summarized by N1 and the column totals summarized by M1 and M2. Now, once we have that observed information from our study, for the calculation of the chi-squared test, we next need to calculate the expected 2x2 two two table. In other words, what's the expected number of events we would see if we truly had independent uh, probabilities for the exposure and the disease? So again, one way we can calculate this is the overall sample size, N, capital N, times that probability of the exposure at the ith level, in this case one or two, yes or no, times the probability of the disease at the jth level, yes or no, one or two. Now, in our actual context of this 2x2 two two table, and we've defined the margin totals, we can calculate the expected number of events in terms of the capital N and the lowercase n and m. For example, the expected number of events, or what we might observe in the ith row and jth column, is going to be equal, ultimately, to the product of n sub i times m sub j divided by the total sample size, capital N. 
And so we see here that we can take that information from the observed, the n sub i's and the n sub m sub j's, and calculate what ends up being our two by two table for what we expect to observe. This table is important because we'll see on the next slide, it's used in the calculation of our test statistic. So the chi-squared test statistic is really summarizing how much the entries in what we observed deviate from an assum assumption of independence if we actually had observed truly independent events. Now what Carl Pearson did is he combined this information from the observed and the expected tables in this nice calculation summing over the different observed and expected combinations and how much they deviate. What he identified is that this calculation is approximately distributed as a chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom, which we've noticed previously can also be thought of as the square of a standard normal distribution, or that's the direct relationship between the chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom and the normal distribution when the mean is zero and the variance is one. Now, one caveat to mention though is that in this case we're dealing with categorical data or discrete data. However, we're trying to apply a continuous approximation to the discrete distribution. In, we, in our case, we can think of it as either the chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom or even the square of that standard normal distribution. Because of that, we oftentimes would rather want to use a version of the statistic that corrects for continuity or applies a continuity correction. And that's what we see down below here is another version of our chi-squared statistic but it includes a slight offset, minus 0.5, to account for the fact that we're trying to approximate the discrete distribution with the continuous one. Interestingly though, we still achieve the same approximate distribution that's chi-squared with one degree of freedom. Now there's a few things to note about this. One is maybe a silver lining. We're going to be introducing the background a lot of a lot of these methods, but we're really going to leverage the ability of R to do a lot of these calculations for us. One assumption then for the chi-squared that we have to make before we wholesale run with it and interpret the results is that we need to make sure that all of the expected values in our data of that expected two by two table are greater than or equal to five. Otherwise, we must consider other tests to evaluate our test of association. We can also note that while we're presenting here as a two by two table, the chi-squared test of independence can be generalized to an arbitrary R by C table, where then the subscripts on the O and the E for our observed and expected cells will just range from one to R and one to C instead of one to two. On the next slide, we're going to look at how we can use R to obtain measures of effect size, both for the risk difference, the relative risk, and the odds ratio, and also how we can evaluate the test of independence for the chi-squared test. So let's recall our example with lung cancer and drinking. So we measure drinking status as heavy or not heavy, and if someone developed lung cancer, yes or no. Now we can take this information and do all the calculations by hand like we had the formulas on the previous slides or in the last lecture set. But also we're fortunate that we can actually leverage R to do this for us. So we see here at the bottom of the slide is just our snippet of code that's allowing us to create a matrix and then renaming the rows and columns um, with respect to drinking status or lung cancer like our 2x2 two two table has. So let's first look at the measures of effect and just note the comparisons from our last lecture that we, where we calculated them by hand. The first thing to note is that there's a host of different packages and functions that will do this for you, but we're just illustrating right now this example with the EPR package, um, which we're loading here with our first statement, library EPR, and then we're fitting the uh, function epi.2x2 two two to our LC object we created for our lung cancer data set. And we see below the output for the results. And so the first thing I'll note is I'll just put a little box around sort of our two by two table summary, which we also had in the previous slide written out, but it recreates that for us on our output so we can you know, verify that the way we entered the data was correct and it aligns with what we were expecting. So there's no typos or we didn't mix up the order and put the uh, absence of the outcome before the presence. The thing that's then useful to note is below we have these 
first three um, items, which includes our risk ratio, the odds ratio, and the attributable risk. Or in our case, that's our risk difference, but in the presentation here, they multiply it by 100. So it's 0.77 instead of 0 0.007. One thing we can note as well is that they automatically are providing us our 95% confidence intervals. And we can also note that there's some subtle differences from what we observed previously, where the risk difference was marginally significant, but here we see that it's actually the confidence interval here does include zero and is on the other side of being marginally insignificant, statistically speaking. This again is a nice illustration, I think, that we can calculate these values by hand like we did on the previous slides, and we may be asked to do so maybe on an exam or a homework assignment, but in practice we can leverage or check our work with R in some of these packages. In addition to describing our measures of effect, we may wish to conduct our chi-square test of independence to see if there is any association ex expected between the drinking status and lung cancer disease outcome. Now, we were noted on the previous slides for the chi-squared statistic derivation that there is both a original sort of calculation here at the top line of code, but also a continuity corrected version as well. We can see that in certain cases it can be pretty important which one we use and depending on our situation because here we see we actually have a p-value less than 0.05 when we don't correct for continuity which again is not always I think the best practice and we, when we do correct for continuity with Yates continuity correction our p-value is slightly above 0.05. Now one of the challenges here is what do we interpret and use? Um, I would say holistically looking at all the results here as well as on our previous slide evaluating our different effect size summaries, how they were either insignificant or marginally significant in by hand or using the package, I would say our overall conclusion is that there doesn't appear to be a lot of concrete evidence that there is an association between drinking status and lung cancer, um, but it is marginally significant in some cases and depending on the test we use, and we may wish to evaluate it in greater detail in another study. Formally speaking, for our test of independence, we would say for the chi-square test without the continuity correction, we reject H0, and in that case we would say lung cancer and drinking are related or associated. However, if we did interpret Yates continuity correction, we would then say we fail to reject H0, and we'd say lung cancer and drinking are not related. So adding in a little interjection to our conclusion there for these two different versions of the chi-squared test. So what should we do if we happen to have small sample sizes, or more realistically, if we happen to violate that assumption of our expected cell count for the chi-squared test? If we find that that assumption has been violated, we need to use a different test. The reason is because, again, note that we're using a chi-square distribution to approximate that discrete count of, inf of our outcome. And that, of course, chi-squared is a continuous distribution which has its direct relationship to the standard normal squ distribution squared. If we have less than five expected uh, observations per cell, this approximation or the normal asymptotics may not be as accurate as we would hope. In these cases, we should instead look at using exact versions of tests such as Fisher's exact test or Barnard's exact test. So let's introduce some motivation between these two tests before seeing them in example. Fisher's exact test is a two sample or conditional analog to the exact one sample binomial test you may have learned about in previous stats classes and it'll give us an exact p-value result for any 2x2 two two table based upon a calculation from a hypergeometric distribution. Now we're not going to do these calculations by hand because there's some extra steps and again R will do it pretty efficiently for us, but one of the things that it assumes, or Fisher assumes when he I guess implemented this test and proposed it, was that the margins of our 2x2 two two table are fixed. So the number of exposures and the number of disease statuses we see 
are fixed at those values, but we can change how they may be split up between the different cells. One thing we can note is that as the sample size does increase, and we actually have the chi-square test being more appropriate, we can see a direct connection where Fisher's exact p-value will converge and approximate to the chi-square test p-value. And this is even more quickly true for sample sizes when we apply Yates continuity correction to our chi-squared test. And again, this is a nice property because large samples for Fisher's exact test can be computationally intensive, although it's becoming less and less of a concern as our computational power increases. One fun fact about the generation of this test, Fisher supposedly derived this test for the lady tasting tea experiment, where a young woman proposed that she could taste the difference if the tea or the milk was put in first. And so Fisher came up with a mini randomized experiment based on these exact uh, probabilities from a hypergeometric distribution to test that hypothesis. Another test we can consider is known as Barnard's exact test. And in this case, Barnard proposed three different types of designs that would have different distributional assumptions in the calculation of their p-value. He described if you had a cross-sectional study, we would calculate the p-value from a multinomial distribution. A case control study would use the product of two independent binomial distributions. Or, similar to the Lady Hastings T setup that Fisher had, we also have this third point here, where designs could stop once a set number of events have been observed and would be based on a hypergeometric distribution. Now, here the p-values are calculated by allowing different parts of the margin to vary depending on the given design can result in more combinations to explore in the calculations than Fisher's test, which made it a little less popular originally because it was more computationally intensive. Also, Fisher can be somewhat of a bully, and so he bullied Bernard to retracting his paper. Um, but the computational issue was there nonetheless. However, nowadays where it's not as much of a concern to have the computational burden, especially for two by two tables, it has been shown that Bernard's test is actually more powerful than Fisher's exact test in our context of thinking about power and type one error rate, and computational concerns are really not much of a concern with modern computing. So let's look at an example and calculate these in R. Let's suppose we did a retrospective study on the deaths of all men aged 50 to 54 in a specific county over the course of one month. Of the 35 men who died of cardiovascular disease, five were on a high salt diet before they died. Of 25 men who died of other causes, two were on a high salt diet. Is there a potential association between a high salt diet and CVD? Well, the first question we want to ask ourselves is, can we not use the chi-squared test in this case? Do we have any cell counts that are less than five? And so we can note this, you know, all we need is one cell count where it's less than five, and we can just start, let's say, with the A cell, or the high salt level and death from cardiovascular disease with five counts. Now, in our situation here, we have N1 times M1 divided by N, and that's going to be for our expected count in 1, 1, or A. So here we can see we can plug in our N1 of 7 times our M1 of 35, divide that by our overall sample size of 60, and what we'll see is if we carry this out, we get a value of 4.08, which is in fact less than 5. Because of that, the chi-square test would be inappropriate, and we should explore using something like Fisher's or Bernard's test. So let's see how we can do this in R. Of course, our first step is that we need to create some object like a matrix to store the counts of our observations so we can actually run the test. Here we've added that in the matrix by specifying the number of columns that we want to enter the data by row when R is thinking about how it's arranging the information. We've also then given it the names for the rows and the columns as well as the individual rows has high and low or the individual columns has death from CVD or other. Fisher's exact test is a function that's built into base R and so we can literally just run this fisher.test function um, right from the command line or in RStudio or in base R um, as soon as we have the data ready to go. So let's say we run that based on our experiment, and we get the following output here below. What we can home in on is our p-value here is quite larger than 0.05. It's about 
And so with that we can reach the conclusion that we are going to fail to reject H naught. Um, we cannot conclude there is a difference between our salt or in the diet and cause of death. Likewise, we can run the same test using Bernard's exact test. One caveat here is that it's not a default function in R, so we do have to load a special library, and there's a couple that exist. Here we're using the library desk tools to run the Bernard test. And we see here that if we run that on our 2x2 two two matrix, we get a similar result. The p-value is greater than 0.05, Therefore, we're going to draw the same conclusion that we fail to reject H naught. Yada, yada, yada. There is no, um, we fail to reject H naught. There is no difference between the two groups. We can't declare that there is that um, independence or lack of association. So with that, let's close out this review or overview of tests for 2x2 two two or categorical data analysis by looking at what we can do when we have paired samples of data. And let's start this with a motivating example. Here a study was done to compare two chemotherapy regimens. Subjects were matched by age and stage of their disease and a random member of each pair then received either treatment A or treatment B then. The patients were followed for five years with survival as their outcome variable. In total, there was 1,242 patients or 621 pairs. When the study was done, they calculated the survival rate in treatment A was approximately 84.7% and in B it was 82.9%. We can also note with this information we could make a nice 2x2 two two table, which we see taking this and putting it down here below. So those are pretty similar rates, but we may want to know still, is there a meaningful difference in that uh, survival in A versus B? So let's say we do set up our two by two table as we see here, and we ran a chi-squared test. What we would identify is that there is no significant difference between these rates based on this two by two table and a chi-squared test of independence. So we would again have a P greater than 0.05 and conclude there was no significant difference or they're not independent. However, the chi-squared test is only valid if the two samples are independent, or we expect they could be independent. In our case, we know they are not because we've matched them on their age and the stage of their disease. So therefore, the groups are not independent, and the chi-squared test is not an appropriate analysis to use. What we can actually do is set up a different type of 2x2 two two contingency table based on the matched pair as our unit of observation instead of each of the people involved in the study. When we match upon the pairs of data, we get the following 2x2 two two table, where we have in bold here on our off diagonal, these values of 16 and 5, are the discordant pairs of data. In other words, there's some difference where one survived in A and not B, or vice versa. This then stands in contrast to our concordant measures, um, 5, 10, and 90, or in cells A and D, which represent the proportion where both survived or both died. To analyze this type of data and account for that paired structure appropriately, we need to use a test like McNamara's. This is specifically designed for paired data in a form of two by two tables. Now the general idea that we would do is that we first ignore those concordant pairs in A and D. We want to focus only on B and C where we have discordant pairs and we want to test this idea are they occurring in equal frequency? So if we let lowercase p equal the probability a patient on treatment A lived given that the paired patients had different outcomes, we can test that as a null hypothesis that p is equal to 1 half. In other words, there was no difference in the proportion who survived in A versus B or B versus A. Now as is common with proportions in different ways we can evaluate them, we can test the hypothesis using either exact or normal approximation methods. And by that I mean in a large sample, in our case if the number of discordant pairs is greater than or equal to 20, 
we can use asymptotic methods or normal theory tests where we can approximate our p-value ultimately by a continuous normal distribution. In situations though where we have a smaller sample size such as less than 20 discordant pairs, we'd be better off calculating the exact probability such as using an exact binomial test. Again, we're not going to do these calculations ourselves in class, but we can note here's what's happening under the hood when R is running these calculations on our behalf. So again, if we let ND be the number of discordant pairs, then we'll let N sub A be the number of discordant pairs where treatment A patient lived versus B. Or conversely, we could define it as tre the treatment B patient living. We just need to choose one of those two perspectives, A or B, for the calculations. In the case of our large sample calculation with a continuity correction, we see we can calculate again a chi-squared type statistic given the relationship between discordant pairs and the number that lived versus not. And we see that this is, like we've seen previously, distributed as a chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom. And then we can calculate our p-value asymptotically by comparing that test statistic x squared to the chi-squared distribution with that one degree of freedom. Alternatively, with our small samples less than 20, we can calculate the exact binomial probability based on one of these three different scenarios where either we will um, take the sum from 0 up to Na, from Na up to Nd, or if we have exactly half, we'll just know that the p-value is equal to 1.0 and don't have to do any calculation at all. Again, we can do those by hand, but R does provide us that functionality itself for us to use and leverage. So again, we see here we're defining a matrix to store those results in for our outcomes by pairs. And then we're going to run mcnamar.test, which is a built-in function in R. And we're going to run it without the correction and with the continuity correction. Now, in this case, if we run both ones and we take a look at where our p-value is in our output, we can note in both cases p is less than 0.05, so our conclusion would be that we reject h0. We can say then that p is not equal to 1 half, which was our null hypothesis. Or in other words, there actually does appear to be a difference between treatment A and treatment B when we consider the paired nature of the study design and correctly account for that in our analysis. And in our case here, it's a strong enough effect that with or without the continuity correction, our p-value is less than 0.05 in both cases. To close, I just want to draw some highlights to the connections for other tests that we won't talk about. One is that McNamara's test is equivalent to a one-sample method. Remember, here we have two samples or two groups. Um, a one-sample method for paired qualitative data, which is known as the sign test. And it's also useful to note that the uh, McNamara's test is actually a special case of the Cochrane Mantle Hansel test for stratified or matched data, which can really generalize to more than a 2x2 two two table, um, which can be useful in cases where we do have multiple potential groups to consider. And with that, we'll wrap up our discussion of categorical data analysis and 2x2 two two tables and move forward next week to looking at non parametric methods and bootstrap approaches.